even though it feels like they're making us cooler, refrigerators and air conditioners are actually making our world warmer. Not only do they use a huge amount of electricity, but many older cooling methods also released tons of molecules that are nearly indestructible and shredding our ozone layer. So how can we keep ourselves and our food cool without accidentally warming up our world? As humans, we've gone to sometimes crazy lengths to keep cool in the summer heat. Thousands of years ago, inhabitants of ancient Persia built giant domes that used evaporative cooling to make and store ice. For thousands of years, people have dug deep pits underground to keep food from spoiling. In the 1800s, people shipped ice across the United States and halfway around the globe just to have a cool drink on a hot summer day. And then, in 1918, the first self-contained home refrigeration unit was unveiled, forever changing kitchens. Today, fridges and AC units are everywhere. But you might wonder where all the extra heat goes when you cool down your home, and how a bunch of chemicals in your freezer turn water into ice. Well, let's start with your air conditioner. Your air conditioner contains a chemical refrigerant. What makes the refrigerant special is that it can transition between a gas and a liquid at a relatively low temperature. The refrigerant is kept as a high pressure liquid until it reaches an expansion valve. Here, it's allowed to expand in an area of lower pressure, partially vaporizing and cooling down. The refrigerant is now the coldest it will be during the cycle and moves into a series of evaporation coils. Warm air from inside the house is pulled into the air conditioner and then over these coils. Heat from the warm air moves into the refrigerant. This causes the refrigerant to change from a liquid to a gas and also cools down the warm air. The now cold air is blown back into your home. But now you have this hot gas refrigerant that you need to cool down and turn back into a liquid so the process can repeat. A compressor pump compresses the refrigerant into a high temperature, high pressure gas, and then moves it into a condenser, another set of coils that is open to the outside air. There, the refrigerant releases its excess heat into the outside air, which is pushed away from your house with a powerful fan. This cools the refrigerant gas back down, turning it back into a liquid. And that's why if you stand by the condenser coils of your air conditioner, you'll get a face full of hot air. The heat you're feeling is all the collected heat from your house being released outside. And now the cooled refrigerant moves back to the original evaporation tubing, repeating the cycle again and keeping your home cool. All of this works because of the second law of thermodynamics, which says that heat will spontaneously move from an area of warm temperature to an area of cold temperature. This is what causes the heat from the inside air to flow into the refrigerant in the evaporation coils, and for the heat from the refrigerant to flow into the outside air in the condenser. Refrigerators work in a similar way. If you take a peek behind your fridge, you might even see a series of coils. These are condenser coils, shedding heat from your fridge into your kitchen. But you can't just use any liquid as a refrigerant. You need something with a low boiling point, allowing it to transition from a liquid to a gas in your refrigeration system. It also has to be able to liquefy when compressed, and it needs to absorb lots of heat as it vaporizes. A bunch of different chemicals have been used for this over the years, starting with ether. Yeah, that's the same molecule that old-timey doctors used to knock people out. It was soon followed by ammonia, methyl chloride, sulfur dioxide, and a couple of other chemicals. But these each had their own problems, from being fire hazards to smelling like rotten eggs, which is gross. Ammonia, by the way, is actually even still used today. But finally, in the late 1920s, chlorofluorocarbons were invented. Now, you may have heard of chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs before. As their name implies, they're composed of chlorine, fluorine, and carbon. Their structures look like this, with a central carbon or carbons surrounded by fluorine and chlorine molecules. They're amazing because they're stable, odorless, non-toxic, and not to mention cheap to manufacture. And because they have that and all those valuable heat exchanging properties we talked about earlier, they became the go-to refrigerants. All of these benefits meant that they started to turn up everywhere, including in things like insulating foams and aerosol cans. And by 1980, the world was producing around a million tons of CFCs each year. Now, maybe right now you're thinking to yourself, wait, aren't CFCs bad for the environment? And yeah, you'd be right. They are horrible for our atmosphere. That's because one of the properties that made CFCs so attractive as refrigerants, their stability, also means that they'll stick around in the atmosphere for decades. 
And over that time, they're carried by winds up into our atmosphere, including the stratosphere and the ozone layer. This layer of our atmosphere, over 15 kilometers thick, contains ozone, a molecule composed of three oxygen atoms rather than the typical O2 we need to breathe. But that whole layer isn't packed with ozone molecules. Instead, they're spread out, so far out that if you squish them all down to normal atmospheric pressure, they would create a layer that is only three to five millimeters thick. The ozone molecules in our atmosphere protect the surface of our planet from the sun's harmful UV radiation. But that same radiation is also what creates the ozone in the first place. The radiation breaks O2 molecules into two single oxygen atoms. These really want to react with other atoms, so they float around until they can come into contact and combine with oxygen molecules to make O3, or ozone. Each year in late winter and early spring, a hole forms in the ozone layer over the southern hemisphere. That's right, the ozone hole so many of us learned about in school is seasonal. And there's also seasonal depletion of the ozone layer seen across the globe, with noticeable depletion in the mid-latitudes and the smallest effect seen in the tropics. Ideally, the formation and destruction of O3 molecules stays in equilibrium so that we don't have too much or too little. But the refrigerants ruined that balance. In the 1970s, scientists discovered that these processes were not in equilibrium and that refrigerants like CFCs were actually interfering with the normal ozone cycle. When CFCs reach the ozone layer, solar radiation can break them apart, leaving lone chlorine atoms floating around in the atmosphere. These can break down ozone molecules, leaving behind O2 and ClO, or chlorine monoxide. Now that would be bad enough, but the oxygen atom in chlorine monoxide can go on to combine with a lone oxygen atom in the atmosphere to become O2, leaving behind chlorine again. This means we once again have a chlorine atom that can then react with a different O3 molecule, starting the whole process over and over again. In fact, one chlorine atom can destroy up to 100,000 ozone molecules. And chlorine isn't the only thing that can break apart ozone molecules. Bromine from halons and methyl bromide found in things like fire extinguishers and pesticides also contributes to the Antarctic ozone hole. And bromine can even be 40 to 100 times more destructive to ozone than chlorine. For more info on those bromine reactions and a fascinating cameo by polar clouds in the stratosphere, check out the link in the description. So this is pretty bad. Once we figured this out, CFCs were already abundant around the world and in the atmosphere. And they weren't just used as refrigerants, they were in aerosol propellants from bug spray, hairspray, paint, asthma inhalers, to more, the list just goes on and on. In 1985, scientists realized that dramatic thinning of ozone above Antarctica was suddenly appearing each spring. When they looked back at their older measurements, they found that the thinning began in about 1980. And even though a number of nations agreed to phase out CFCs in the late 80s, the hole continued to expand, reaching its largest, broadest point in 2000. Thankfully, it's starting to recover as we continue to phase out CFCs. But because these chemicals are so stable in the atmosphere, scientists believe it'll be the year 2070 by the time it returns to the size it was in just 1980. But CFCs are still being released into the atmosphere now. Though the world stopped producing new refrigerators with CFCs by 2010, there are plenty of old refrigerators and insulating foams still slowly leaking them into the atmosphere. And even despite the global ban on CFCs, some regions around the world apparently continue to produce them, raising emissions to the atmosphere from 2013 through 2017. Monitoring stations around the world were able to show that some of the emission increase is happening in eastern China. Evidence points to renewed production being the cause of the increase. So how do we solve the problem of these chlorine atoms flying around and destroying ozone? One way would be to make refrigerants without chlorine in them or molecules that broke down before they ever reached the stratosphere. And that's what we've been doing for years now. Instead of using chlorofluorocarbons, modern refrigerants are often either hydrofluorocarbons or hydrochlorofluorocarbons, which are less damaging to the ozone. They're a mouthful, but these newer refrigerants either don't contain chlorine or are much less efficient at breaking down ozone. But these new refrigerants aren't perfect either. HCFCs still do deplete ozone, though by a smaller amount, and their production is already being phased out around the world. And HFCs are set to be phased down by 2047. 
They can also be very strong greenhouse gases, which, you know, also real bad. And there's another thing we haven't touched on at all yet. The huge amount of energy your refrigerator and AC use to power the compressor and multiple fans needed to keep you and your food cool. It's estimated that in the United States, we use about 6% of all the energy our entire country produces just to power our air conditioners. 6%. The entire state of Rhode Island uses less than 1% of total energy produced. So what are our other options for keeping our food and ourselves cool? We can start by using shorter lived gases like hydrofluorolefins, and many car manufacturers have already started doing this. But another possibility is to use magnets. Yeah, magnets. Some materials are magnetocaloric. This means that they warm up when placed into a magnetic field and then cool down when they're removed from that magnetic field. Now, magnetic refrigerators aren't a new idea. Early models date back to the 1930s, and they've been used in some labs to reach temperatures near absolute zero, but that's like negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit, which is way too cold to store your food. And these models are expensive. But now, companies are working on new magnetic fridges that are cheaper and work at temperatures around 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, a nice brisk temperature to keep your lettuce crunchy. But they're not quite ready to be rolled out to every home yet, and concerns still exist about their large weight and their cooling range. However, one estimate suggests that if we converted all refrigerators to magnetic systems, we could save up to $10 billion a year in electricity because they're extremely efficient and less energy means less CO2 release from producing all that energy, as well as fewer ozone depleting gases. But until then, maybe just try turning up your AC a few degrees. You might be a little bit warmer, but hey, you can spend all that extra money you saved on mint chocolate chip. Mm-hmm. Worth it for the planet and the ice cream. <laughs>